Well, Messiah would teach uh, in many ways. He would uh, tell stories. Um, he would, uh, we have different kinds of stories. The, of course, the parables. And what is a parable? A story that what? It has points, okay. So, what's that? Teaches a lesson, yep. So the words of the parable, it could be said, are more than just the words, behind the words. And so he would teach in parables, and he would explain to his apostles and his disciples. Uh, he would explain to them because he was planting the seeds within our people. Every time that he would, he would tell a story and be present. Uh, we see that he, he used the precepts from the Tanakh, uh, later to be called the Tanakh, we call the Old Testament, uh, as a way to uh, illustrate certain things. Uh, if you would turn over to the book of the Gospel of John, please. Gospel of John, chapter 5. So the stories behind the stories um, are the things that add the texture and, and the layers to. Uh, the fathers say that the Gospels are almost infinite in the various things that we can see. You may have read this your entire life, uh, but there's always something different to see, something perhaps even that adds the texture depth. Uh, when you have uh, a drawing of a certain person, or maybe it's a, it's a building, uh, and it, it looks two-dimensional, but then you start adding shading to it, and you start adding color, uh, and perhaps even a depth, uh, then now you begin to see the picture even more clearly. So the story is, in verse 1, after this was a feast of the Jews, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and whosoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. The fathers say that this feast uh, that in which Messiah was there uh, in Jerusalem was the feast of Shavuot, which we also call what? What, what is, what is What's that? Pentecost. Okay, five weeks. Or, so this time uh, which he was there, this event had been happening for quite some time. Uh, it was a, uh, a, that which drew many, many people who were sick because in many ways, in many times, this was the only hope they had. But only one person could be healed at a time. So th from this, what, what do you think that this is, is portraying? What, what um, calls out to you about these four verses that we've just read? Desperation. Okay, desperation, yes. Faith of healing. Mm -hmm. His compassion. He was there with him. Okay. Yep. Um, so in the architecture of Jerusalem, the, the sheep's pool uh, was, of course, near the temple. Uh, and this is the place in which uh, um, when the, the lambs in particular were uh, prepared for sacrifices, the, the entrails would be removed from the animal. Uh, and they would be taken down to the sheep's pool, which is where we are right now. And these entrails would be washed in the pool uh, to prepare them for the sacrifice. Okay? Because what, what would happen to those entrails? They would, be, they would be burnt, they would be a burnt offering to, to God. And so we see that this was a place of significance. I mean, something special was happening at this particular pool. Um, and so in this time, in this place, that the Jewish people believe that the washing of the entrails of the sacrificial lamb in this pool brought divine power. Why do you think they would assume that? Okay, it was consecrated to God. The, the, the sacrifice was consecrated, washed in this pool. 
Okay, why else? There was blood in the water. Okay, blood in the water. Well, other miracles have already taken place there. Yep, other miracles. So, and we've just, we have just seen that this, um, that there were, an, an angel of the Lord would appear, or at least you could see the action that was happening. Well, the, the water per se did not have the divine power, but the angel of the Lord infused the water with a divine and healing power so that this first person would be cured of their illnesses. So, so think about what we just said. Pool, where, where the sacrifice has been washed. Divine power is infused into this, and then healing happens. What does that speak to you of? Baptism, yes. We call this foreshadowing, and it's of the many things of the Old Testament, uh, there are the foreshadowing. It was a like, something like, pointing to something deeper and, and even, more, even more beautiful. Uh, how many times have we read this and simply said, it was a story about a man being healed of, of his paralysis, but the depth of what is happening here is, is actually even deeper. So this is a foreshadowing of the baptism of, in Messiah in the, which the one going under the water is cured of spiritual illnesses. Okay? So when one is baptized into Messiah, into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, most people do not experience a physical healing of that, but they experience a spiritual healing. So we have the, the three types of, of people. What does it say? Blind, what else? Sick. Okay, um, so blind, lame, and paralyzed. Okay, they were waiting to be healed. So spiritually, the blind signify those whose spiritual eyes are darkened and cannot distinguish between good and evil. The lame, who are paralyzed, can neither practice virtue nor make any spiritual progress. And another word in a different translation, I think, for, for paralyzed is, is withered. So the, the paralyzed or withered are those who are in complete despair because of their inability to accomplish anything good. Okay, let's look back over that. So blindness. Can't discern between good and evil. Does that sound like the world? Doesn't know what, what good is anymore. Doesn't know what is evil in fact, almost runs towards evil and away from good. Um, this is a, a spiritual blindness. Okay? The lame who are paralyzed, or say, cannot practice virtue or make any progress. Do we have to advance in God? Absolutely. Um, God didn't call you or me or, or any of our brothers and sisters to just stay the same. He's always calling us to progress and to move forward. And paralyzed or withered are in despair because of their inability to accomplish anything good. So these are the things in which God heals us. So in the pool of Bethsaida, only the first person to enter after the angel had stirred up the water could be healed. But in baptism, how many can be healed? Everyone. Everyone who comes to this pool a foreshadowing of this pool in the sheep's pool was a foreshadowing of the baptism of Messiah, where the old only one at a time, but now whosoever comes can be healed. Baruch Hashem. And yet it's still only by one healing. Yep. Yep, absolutely. One by one individually, for sure. So Bethsaida um, means house of sheep. Sheep's fold. Um, we see all of the, the names of the various places have such significance. So we see that this is something deep. So they were spurred by the washing of the sheep's entrails and the movement of the angel. That person was, was healed. Um, what do you think that the, the entrails of the sheep were, were, were signifying? For us. Say again? 
Yes. Yes. And what else? The, the significance of, of why was a sheep or lamb, lamb's entrails? Yes. Yes. Both, those are, are both the correct answers of, of this, the significance. And again, this is going to be something that I would in, in, encourage you to, to think about um, outside of, of, of the message today, to go back and to look at and see the beautiful significance. Verse 5, continuing. Now a certain man who was there who had an infirmity for how many years? 38. 38. When Yeshua saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be well? Okay. And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Okay. What do you notice about this particular person? When Messiah asked him if he wanted to be healed, how could, he, how could have he responded? Yes, please, more than anything. Yes, please, more than anything? Okay. What else? Think of the duration of his illness. How could have he responded? I've had it for so long, what's the point? It's always going to be like this. What else? Despair? Okay. All right. In his mind, that was, that was the only way that he could be cured. You think he could have been bitter for having been in this state for so long? Well, he didn't answer the question directly. He explained why instead of answering the question. Okay. You know, I always wondered about that passage. It's, it's, it's 38 years. Why has no one offered to help him? I mean, what, like, we're all supposed to be esteeming others higher than self. And here is this man that's been doing this at the pool for 38 years and no one took, took it in their office to say, let me help you, brother. Let right. me help you, friend. Yep. You know? Absolutely. Those are the questions. He answered in humility to the man standing next to, or answer, asking him this question. How are we about the things that seemingly for take forever in our lives to be resolved? Well, for a lesson that we can learn from the paralytic is to never give up, but to keep pressing forward. What do you think if this man decided that day to not go to the pool, but he, he missed a day for whatever reason, and he goes back the next day? Who probably wasn't there? Yeshua. Yeshua. And he probably was going to miss the angel again. We see that this, again, is... The, it, it took... Dedication for this man to go every day. To go every day, day after day after day. You know, it just says a certain time. Um, I don't know if that was on a daily basis, if it was on a weekly basis. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but however it happened, um, there, it was predictable enough that they would, they would, it would be present. So continuing in verse 8. So Messiah says, Rise up and take your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Okay. So if this was obviously um, Shavuot, Pentecost, that is one of the Sabbaths. And what is, according to, to the Torah, what is not to be done on the Sabbath? Work, Work really, Work. Of, of any kind. So we see that something happened particularly. A wolf in over to um, verse 10 says that the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful, you, lawful for you to carry your bed. So after being paralyzed for 38 years, what do you think, what was the state of this man's body? Okay, atrophied. Withered. Um, what was that? He was weak. Okay? It doesn't say if his entire body was paralyzed or if it was his lower body, but it, whatever it was, it was significant. Um, so because of his paral paralyzation and his, it appears to be his, his travel route, which was wherever he lived, to the pool and back to home, 
and back to the pool. He had never seen Messiah to do a miracle. But he heard the words of Messiah, and what did he do? Did he say, I can't do that. Can't you see me? I can't do what you just said for me to do. He heard the words, and he obeyed out of faith. And strength shot back into his body. It, it entered him, and he took up his mat. And the people around see this man who they know what he's been dealing with for the past, however long they've known or seen him. And what do they say? Glory to God, you're healed. No. What do they say? What are you Sabbath. Doing? It's the Sabbath. You can't do that. He's carrying his mat or his bed, for lack of a better term. You can't do that. Yes. The one who represents the Sabbath is present with them. Okay. <laughs> Probably nobody would have said anything. Probably. Who knows? I'm sure somebody would have been. The schnickerdoodle. He could have used the same word too. Lord, I can't. He could have. He could have. So Messiah heals on the Sabbath because he is showing that a new way to honor the Sabbath is to do good and refrain from evil. Okay. He even says in another point to the Pharisee, if your sheep falls into the ditch, what do you do? Well, you get it out. Okay. The preservation of life, the healing should have always been more than don't pick up stuff. And that's what Messiah was, was showing. He was saying, I'm building on what I gave to you, and now I'm deepening it. I'm making it into something that is the purpose for which I planted the original tree. Continuing in verse 11. He answered them, he says, he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Yeshua had withdrawn in a multitude being in that place. Okay? So it is as if he is saying to them, I've been paralyzed my, almost my whole life. And you're telling me the one who healed me, I shouldn't have obeyed him? No, I hearkened to the voice of the one who bid me rise. Be healed. Take up your bed and go home. So instead of acknowledging the glorious miracle, the people blinded themselves to the miraculous action that had been done by condemning it saying that the healer and the healed man had, had violated the Sabbath. So think back now to the first few verses where it had the three spiritual sicknesses. What, was, what would this be representative of? Which represents what? Spiritual blindness is the what? What's that? Okay, a lack of faith. It's the inability to discern between good and evil. Okay, so something good happened right in front of them, yes? yes. What happened? A, a, a miraculous divine healing happened in front of them. But they said that was evil because of the blindness. They couldn't see the good that had been done because of, of the blindness of their eyes and their hearts. And so we see that this, again, builds upon the initial point in which Messiah came to, and, he, and his words, and the, the words of the gospel are so rich with depth and meaning. In verse 14, it says, Afterwards, Yeshua found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. What does he say now? Sin no more. Okay. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. 
And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Yeshua who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Yeshua and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Okay, so what do we ascertain from, from, this, from the words that Messiah spoke to him? Why was he paralyzed? Because there was something, he, had, he had done something in the past. Okay, and when we read the stories and the parables of Messiah, was every time somebody was sick, was it because, or, 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 or diseased, was it because they had, they had sinned? No, it wasn't. Um, the, the blind man, nothing. He was born blind. And they said, you know, who sinned, this man or, or his parents? And he was like, nobody sinned. This happened so that a miracle would happen so that you would believe. But this, in this particular instance, this man had sinned. And so... We see that there was something that, was, that had been, been occurring. He says, go and sin no more, lest worse things befall you. We must correct our sins so this does not happen to us. Even if we do not see the great punishment like this man in our lives today, they will await us in the next life unless we continue to repent, to do teshuva and mend our lives. Okay, I want you to, to think of the last few verses that we've read in context of what the sheep's Pool meant, and then, and, then, and then tell me what you think that that, that means in regards, in, in light of the new covenant. What did this man experience as a foreshadowing? Yes? Okay. A changed body? Um, a, a resurrected body? What else? Made well by the blood of the lamb. Uh, it, yes. It doesn't say specifically in the words that he repented, but I have no doubt that he did. Messiah, he who was sick in sin, came to the pool to be healed, and the angel of the Lord who is what? Yeshua. Yeshua. Met him. Healed him. Said, go and sin no more. As a foreshadowing of what you and I experience when we come to baptism and we have that, that time in which we also are, are healed of sicknesses. And he says to us, go and sin no more. And how long does it take, generally, for us after we have received forgiveness? 30 30 seconds, a couple minutes, a couple hours. Constantly have to do teshuva. Constantly have to mend our lives. Um, think of mending. Um, well, we, we don't, probably most of us don't um, mend our socks anymore, right? Ever, ever have a toe sticking out there? Um, it doesn't make, it's, it, you can do it. I'm sure some people do. But we don't, generally don't mend our our socks much anymore. It's, it's not worth our time. So we can just pick up a new pair of socks. A centurion came to one of the fathers and said, Father, does God accept, forgive, or accept repentance? The father said, if you had a cloak like this and you had a hole in it, would you throw it away? And the centurion said, no, Father, I would put a patch on it and mend it. And he said, so it is with God and human, human beings. It's, oh, it's about mending the broken places. So we see that this was a, a type of and foreshadowing something that would occur in not too distant future. Why do you think that this particular event happened on Pentecost. Because it, it wasn't the Pentecost that we know of. It wasn't the Shavuot. What happened on Pentecost that, that we speak of? And that is called what? Go and, and wait for me in Jerusalem where the Comforter will come and you will be baptized with fire and the Spirit. So 
this has a significance of this baptizing, always foreshadowing something deeper. So this mending of our lives. Hold your place there and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord so that we may not be condemned with the world. Okay, let me read that one more time. But when we are judged, we are chastised or chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Okay, chastised, chastened. What is that? It's God's discipline. Punishment, okay? Why does he punish us? Because he just likes to punish? To get our attention, to get our attention that, we, that we repent and turn and, and do teshuva and return to him so that we, we're not judged with the world. Okay, the world represents those that reject God. What is the fate of those who reject God? Permanent condemnation in the life to come. He says... If I do not chasten you, you are not my child. He says, you are not mine. So he who he chastens, he loves. So Messiah takes one who apparently had done teshuva for 38 years, and he healed him and said, not in these particular words, but your faith has made you well. Rise up. Take your bed and go home. And by the way, don't sin again. Okay, who else did he say that to? Go and sin no more. Okay, the woman at the well, who also was lost in sin, who by her faith received salvation, Yeshua himself, and, and had a changed life. Okay, Miriam of Magdala. Also, she was restored. In fact, not just restored, but glorified. And she is called equal to the apostles among the ancient faith. Equal to the apostles. It's not how she started. It's not what she was before she met him. It's who she became and how she finished the race afterwards. Brukashen. Okay, back to, to John. So we experience chastening for a purpose. So we see that he knew, or once he knew, who had healed him. Because he said, I didn't know. I don't know the man. I've never seen him before. He didn't, his face didn't ring a bell. But once Yeshua set, you know, met him, in, and, and where, did, where did he meet him? Which is also interesting. In the temple. Okay? And it continues to build. He, meet, he meets with Yeshua in the temple. And then he, he understood and knew who he was. And he boldly proclaimed, it was Yeshua who healed me. Praise God. So what do you see so far? What jumps out to you? We acknowledge that all that is accomplished is accomplished by God, not ourselves. Okay, all that has been accomplished by God and not by ourselves. Do we do nothing? To, to respond yes. Yes. What else? What else do you see? Deception, saying you can't do this on the Sabbath, you can't, and they're just controlling people. Um, and then Yeshua saying, "No, this is this is this is the way it's supposed to be." Yep. And, and um, it's it's like liberation. He's setting them free from those the bondage of all of the rules and regulations, the man-made rules and regulations of the so-called the Pharisaical Sabbath or something like that. Okay. What else? Okay. 
Amen. Amen. Any, what else? So the sheep's pool is representative of the grace-filled waters of baptism in which the Lamb of God sacrificed for us and was washed in the Jordan by who? Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. Okay. The Lamb of God was washed in the waters of the Jordan. It wasn't in this pool, but there was the washing of the Lamb. The sheep's pool had five porches representing the, the four cardinal virtues of courage, prudence, righteousness, and self-control, plus the contempt contemplation of the divine ways of God. If you were to hear the word contemplation of the divine ways of God, what would you think of? Say again? Okay. Thinking of the virtues of God, sure, yes. Uh, there, this is, this is a, a multifaceted thing. Contemplation of the ways of God. The remembrance of the glorious things that God has done in your life. The times he has brought you through. The times that he has blessed you. These are also the, the divine ways of God. What else is something to contemplate of the divine ways? The incarnation. Yes. The incarnation in Messiah. That's mind-blowing. Just to say, yeah, God became man, and keep going. No, that's beyond explanation. The various things that Messiah has done in, various, in, the, in the points in which he was born, he lived, these are the things that the fathers teach us how to contemplate. If our minds are occupied by the contemplation of divine things, what does it not have time for? The world, sin. How do we occupy our minds? How do we focus ourselves? After we are baptized, we must rise up after this healing miracle. Again, the baptism which heals us of, of the three things. Blindness. What else? Lameness. And, 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 and paralyzation. So after we rise up after this healing miracle and strive to take strength from God that he gives us to become light and free by doing his commandments. In this example of this man, how did he become light and free? By doing the commandments of God. Jesus said, rise up. And he did. He obeyed the command of God standing before him. And he became light and free because he had been freed from not just the physical ailments, but his spiritual sickness. Baruch Hashem. We see that the, the troubled waters, when, whenever the angel would... would, would uh, stir up the waters, are symbolic of the demonic that is agitated whenever someone is brought to baptism. And these demonic powers are crushed and washed out by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Again, all the symbols of the things that occurred of spiritual significance. Like the paralytic, we have no man. Right? When, 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 uh, so when, when Yeshua said to him, uh, um, do you want to be made well? What did he say? He said, okay, I have nobody. I, I have no man to put me in the pool. Okay. In other words, there wasn't a human way possible. It wasn't a rational way. I, I can't do it. I, I tried, but everybody keeps run, jumping in front of me, running over me. But we have no way to do this to bring us to repentance. It is the angel of great counsel of the Father who touches our hearts and troubles it with the thoughts of the torments of those who reject God. Some people were raised in the faith. Um, others came to faith. And part of the reason they came to faith was they began to have an understanding of what happens after this life. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. If you don't have Messiah, there is great trouble in the world to come for you. And so people come many times to faith 
in Messiah because of the trouble that, that they perceive will happen afterwards of this life. And it is a part for, for some journey. So in this example of this man, it wasn't the angel in the water. It was the angel standing before him. Um, the angel of great counsel uh, is um, in, in Isaiah, we're not going to turn there, but Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Um, if you were to look in your Bibles, you'll probably see wonderful counselor, eternal father, prince of peace. But in the Septuagint version, it has the title of angel of great counsel. And it is symbolic and significant of the one who came in, in the times past. Think of the great angel. When, when did he appear in the Old Testament? Okay, the burning bush, yes, Joshua. Um, Abraham. Um, in, in two of those three, he, he appeared in the flesh as a, as a person. Uh, he, he, he was visible in, in, in a form. Uh, but he was, again, the angel of the Lord. Okay? Angel simply means servant. Um, it, this, we're, not, we're, not, um, we're not basically saying that Messiah was, was created. In fact, this was one of the er early um, Christological heresies. They said he was created. Spiritual, but created. Okay. How is the Godhead con composed of? Okay. God has always existed in the form of, of, of the three persons. Uh, Messiah was not created, but he was what? Begotten. Okay. In, in a miraculous way that is inexplicable. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So we see that Messiah took the role all throughout the Bible as the what of God. The Shamish, the servant of God. He appeared visibly, and the only one of the three who appeared visibly. Did, did the Holy Spirit ever, ever take a form? It says he descended like a dove. But he didn't have a form. There was something noticeable that you could see that was happening. It also says on um, Shavuot that something else happened. He, he, he appeared like, like fire, but he didn't have a, a human form, and the Father has never been seen. And yet, the mystery continues. Philip said to Yeshua, Lord, show us the Father. And what did Yeshua say to him? Have I been with you so long? <laughs> I am representative of the Father. I represent my Father. If you see me, you have seen him. Because I am him. I am in him and he is in me. The mysteries of our God, again, this is an example of the contemplation of divine things. It's mind-blowing. When we are washed in holy baptism, we are also in the sheep's pool in which our inward parts our entrails, our hearts, the reins are the deepest part of us in our minds are washed like the entrails of the sacrificial sheep. And thus we are sufficiently prepared to offer our lives like the sheep are offered unto God, that we become a what? Say it. A living sacrifice pleasing to God. Are those not the words of the apostle? Brethren, brothers and sisters, let us present ourselves as living sacrifices to our God. What does living sacrifice mean? Dying daily to yourself, constantly to yourself. You want the Father's will, not your own. Okay. Living constantly for God, dying daily to self. Um, if you are a living sacrifice, it means you're not a what? A not a dead sacrifice. It means that you keep going. By the word sacrifice, what, what does that entail? Okay, laying down, surrender. A sacrifice is a sacrifice because it costs something that has value to us. If, it's not, if it doesn't cost anything of some value, it's not a sacrifice. When our father David wanted to stop the angel that was killing everyone, he, he went to make a sacrifice. And, and what did he say to the man who owned the place where he wanted to sacrifice, and a whole bunch of um, oxen. Yeah. 
The man said, take it. I mean, I mean you're the king. Uh, take it with my blessing. He said, no. No, no, I'm, I'm going to buy it from you because if I do that, it's just empty actions, empty words. Oh, God, help us. <sighs> now, let's go back to conquering something. No, he recognized that he needed to take action. It wasn't just going, okay, God, whatever. No, our father David said, no, I will not offer something to God. That I, have not, I don't have a stake in, I don't have skin in the game, he said. Amen. So we see in this story the beautiful depth of what's present there within the words, behind the words. That can give us and inspire us to go further into our lives in Messiah, to be those that strive after those virtues and also to be those that contemplate the divine things. May you and I find healing and afterwards, may he find us continually within his holy temple, unstained by evil thoughts, and do his, his commandments faithfully. Amen? Again, remember the man when he met with Messiah, he met in the temple. Here's the temple, right here, in our hearts. May we meet with him daily in that place to offer a sacrifice of praise. Father, we thank you for continuing to, to show us, to lead us into the depths of what you have spoken through the mouth of your Messiah, and through the voice of the apostles that you have poured out beautifully. We thank you for loving us so much that you never give up on us, that you never cast us aside, but you strive after us, run after us, pick us up out of the ditch, a master. May we Rise up today and follow you in a new and fresh way. Thank you for being the healer and thank you for being the sacrifice. May we also sacrifice ourselves to you in this life. Amen.